Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, if you're thinking there's a little bit of deja vu, and you've heard this sermon before, just based on the scripture, <laughs> um, I want you to know the scripture. I want this, these beatitudes to just to sit on your heart, to ring through throughout your day. And so we've, we've read uh, both passages, both translations, all the way through uh, for the last couple weeks, and we'll continue, obviously, today and, and in the next week. But that's intentional because I think, I believe they build upon each other. And so to read them separately, I think we do them an injustice. And so today we continue in, in our sermon series on the Beatitudes. And today, or up until today, we've covered what it means to be poor in spirit, to mourn, to be meek, and to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And today we're going to explore what it means when Jesus calls us to be merciful and to be pure in heart. I'm not sure about you, but when I hear the word mercy, I think about, I have flashbacks to this game that I played when I was a kid, when you'd lock hands with your friends or your brother or sister and you try to hurt them. Who played that game? All right, yeah, Calvin's with me. <laughs> um, that's a game that we played often and, and my brothers were much bigger than I was and so I didn't win very often. Um, I didn't cry mercy as much as I cried mommy and then they got in trouble so maybe I did win. But if you don't remember the game, it's basically the point is to inflict pain on your friend or brother or sister. It's so much so that they call out mercy. Stop, stop, mercy, show me mercy. And so when I hear Jesus call us to be merciful, is Jesus calling us to inflict pain on the people around us so that they can then show or call out for mercy and then we have the opportunity to show them? Of course not. That's not what Jesus is calling us to do. Although, he is calling us to show mercy. And out of all of these beatitudes, it seems like this one's the no-brainer. Show mercy to people. But if we remember the context, in the, in the day in which Jesus sat with those folks on the side of the mountain, and he said these things, remember that this is just as countercultural as the rest of the beatitudes. See, the Romans, they despised pity. The Pharisees were harsh and self-righteous, and they showed little mercy. The common belief for most people that they commonly accepted that this explanation for suffering, why people suffered, was because they deserved punishment for their sin. That doesn't leave a lot of room for mercy, does it? So in return, Jesus takes this sharp issue with the world in which he lives in. And so he calls us to be merciful. So mercy, what is it? Well, mercy lays its claim on whatever and whenever there is suffering. It pities every creature, not just man alone. It refrains from cruel sport and, as well as cruel speech. It, it means we don't actively go out and be cruel in our physical actions, and in our words. 
Mercy rejects, rejects cruelty even in cases of deserved punishment. See, we've seen these great acts of mercy all over the last few days and weeks. When disaster strikes our world, people step up and they step out. And they love each other regardless of any kind of relationship or past. We have seen people flock to South Texas just to help their neighbor. We have prayed for them, you and I, from here. We've all sent money through various relief outlets. But mercy. I believe mercy has a much deeper movement than all of that. When we do not, um, when we do not, when it, bleh, I can't speak this morning, when we do not do mercy justice, if we only restore a person's body or home, and we neglect their soul. And I think the thing that helps us ongoing be merciful is prayer. Prayer is that cornerstone of mercy. Prayer is the long-term act of mercy. It keeps us in relationship with, our, with people, with our neighbors and with strangers long after the physical act has passed. This practice of mercy becomes clear. It's a practice. Not just a feeling or, or a sentiment, but it's something we do constantly. See, Jesus, he went and laid his hands on people. He spoke to them. He healed them and he forgave them. And there's no doubt in my mind that Jesus continued to pray for them long after they had left. This wasn't a one and done encounter with Jesus. It's, it is this mercy that allowed Jesus to look into people's hearts and to heal them and forgive them. And it's the same mercy that we are healed and forgiven by. And I pray it's the same mercy that we offer our brothers and sisters in this world, whether they deserve it or not. So for a moment, I want us to gaze out upon our world, whatever that looks like for you. And by practicing mercy, how does that begin to change? By practicing mercy rather than malice, how does that begin to change the world around you, your world? When we meet people in disagreement, if we approach it with mercy, how do those conversations change? For me, in my experience, they, they, it makes a huge difference. Because when we begin to, to meet people with mercy, we begin to be able to see people as people, not as issues or beliefs. It allows us to see Christ in them. And it allows us to see people as Christ sees people. And it also allows us to see how God is at work, not only in our lives, but in the lives of others. And so like the last couple of weeks, each beatitude they build on one another. Mercy is building off of hunger and thirst for righteousness. And mercy is building up to the pure in heart. Jesus goes on to say, blessed are the pure in heart. And I think this is a fascinating beatitude because there aren't any other sayings like this. This is purely something Jesus says. So to be pure in heart, what does that mean? One of my favorite things to do because it gives me a broad spectrum of people and backgrounds, I, I like to ask these questions on Facebook. And I have friends that are all across the world, different beliefs, different settings. And so I asked them, I said, what does it mean to be pure in heart? And they didn't let me down. Here are some of the answers that they gave me. They said to be pure in heart means always the best intentions in mind. Being honest and straightforward. A heart that is free from unadulterated, unadulterated motives. It's a simple desire to serve God and love and love unselfishly. I have some jokesters on Facebook. Uh, this person said to be pure in heart means to have no cholesterol. <laughs> and for some, that's true. <laughs> for others, it's wanting what God wants. One of my friends quoted Charles Wesley. 
a heart from sin set free, a heart that always fills his blood so freely shed for me. Some said it was free from malice and full of grace. Being genuine, real, authentic, and Christ-centered. Those who serve only to glorify and share God's love with no thought or want of glory for themselves. Those are just a few of the great examples people gave me of being pure in heart. And the thing that I want to bring up is that not, not one person who responded to this question, even our kiddos, describe being pure at heart as being perfect. And I think that's important. What we need to understand about this beatitude and know that, that being pure in heart it has nothing to do with being perfect. And here in this particular reference to it, there's no, there's no reference to any sexual purity. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. He's not talking about perfection, and he's not talking about purity. Although those are important things, and he addresses them later on in his ministry, here in the Beatitudes, to be pure in heart means something different. See, the pure in heart have no desire for falsehood, meaning they don't lie. They don't have any reason to deceive one another. In many commentaries that I read, they interpreted pure in heart as a clean heart. Most translate this to mean that pure hearts are, are trying to do God's will. It means we're in tune with what God, with God's voice and what he's calling us to do. To have a pure heart means we have no motive other than to share God's love and grace. And we cannot share God's love and grace if we have any other motive than love. Being pure in heart means that we have to be intentional about removing the things that separate us from God and from people. Sometimes we call those things sin. And it means we're intentional about our actions and our word being the actions and words of Christ. Let's look at it this way for a moment. Having a pure heart is a lot like having pure gold. We burn off all of the junk out of gold that's not gold, so that it's the best piece of gold it can be. For us, we get rid of all of the junk in our lives that hold us back from loving God and loving people so that we can be our best selves. But this idea of pure in heart, it seems like it's the furthest away from all of the other Beatitudes because we're not perfect, because we fail, because we're kind of messy as a people. And that makes us believe that, there's, that this lie that this Beatitude is attainable is beyond us, that we can't do it. And Jesus tells those that have gathered around that the pure in heart will see God. We hear that and we hardly know what is more beyond us here. Perfection or seeing God. See, working to remove these actions and thoughts that, that cause our relationship with God and with people to be broken is tough. It takes our whole being. Being pure in heart takes our minds and our will to accomplish. It means we're intentional. When we do this, we're loving God. And when we're loving God, we're loving people. And when we're loving people, we're loving God. And I think that's the promise, that the pure in heart will we'll see God. It's not this promise in death, but it's this promise for hope here in life, today. It opens our hearts and our minds and our souls up to see God today. And I believe we do this by asking ourselves a simple yet complex question. Where do you see God at work in your life today? And that's what today's sermon is about. It's all about finding God at work in our world today. See, John Wesley, he asked this question often. Every time he would meet with those that gathered, where they saw God at work in their life that day. So I'm going to ask you this morning, where do you see God at work? Where is God at work in your life today? You don't have to answer right now, but I want you to think about it. 
Because it's this important and intentional question that I hope we ask ourselves often. Wesley would incessantly ask you each day, every time he saw you. And I hope it's a question that I tend to ask you in, in a roundabout way once a week. But I think for all of us, myself included, if we find somewhere in between those two, somewhere between once a day and once a week, to ask ourselves this question, I think it helps us notice these less obvious ways that God is at work in our lives. This question is not one that's full of guilt, but one that's full of hope. To reflect upon the godly, merciful moments in our lives, and then the awareness to continue to pray and be in those moments. It causes us to look within our hearts and to remove those impurities that have caused us not to see God and people. When we're intentional about asking this question and we're honest about our answer, we're opening ourselves up to truly see God in the most unexpected places and the most unexpected people. And sometimes, that's us. We see God at work in our own lives and we don't recognize it. So today, it's easy to look around and, and, and hopefully see where God is at work in many places in our lives. We've seen those flock to Texas, helping those who are suffering in the aftermath of Harvey. We've prayed and we've sent money. And we see God at work here in Montana as those go out and they risk their lives to fight fires, to help their friends move and get out of the way. And again, we've sent money in prayer, faithfully, to recover. But what about the not-so-obvious ways in our lives? What about when we ask ourselves, where have we seen God at work in our lives today and we've missed the moments that are right in front of our nose? Maybe it was that neighbor reaching out and saying, hello. Maybe it was a stranger who brought you dinner, or bought your dinner at a restaurant. Maybe it's a simply walking to the post office and somebody waves you across the street because they saw you. It's these moments and many, many more that are so precious. It's the moments that we often overlook for whatever reason. And then we look back and we find God right in the middle of them. It's these little moments that bring us hope and joy in life. They encourage us to share that, and they encourage us to share that hope and joy with other people. So find hope today. And the fact that you will see God, not only in death, but find hope that you will see God today quite possibly before you even leave this building and enter back into the real world. And when you do see God at work, share it. Don't keep it to yourself. Share these experiences with someone. And if you can't put it into words, just pass on that hope and joy to someone else. See, today the call to action is not to try and pity people. The challenge today is not to leave this place perfect. The challenge today is to leave this place different. To let the Holy Spirit have room to work within you so that mercy flows from you. The call to action today is to be pure in heart. To release all of that junk that holds you back from fully loving God and people. Here again, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Ask yourself that question today, tomorrow, and the next day. Where do you see God at work? And then answer that question. And then I want you to share it with someone. If you need to call me, call me. If you want to send in an email, send me an email. My information's in the bulletin. If you want to come by the church and try to catch me here, come on by. For some reason you can't track me down, tell a friend, tell a family member, tell a stranger at the grocery store. Just tell someone. Because it's in these moments we find hope because we see God at work. 
in our lives and in the lives of people around us. So ask that question this morning. Open that door so that others may see God at work in your life and in theirs. Go in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.